Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we're happy to have, uh, uh, to have Bumin Yenmez from Stanford. And he's going to be talking about incentive compatible market design with an application to matching with wages. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming to the seminar. As Jennifer said, I'm going to talk about a market design problem and its applications. I study a general heterogeneous goods market with transfers. This market encompasses several classic models studied in the market design literature, such as seller buyer markets, labor markets, and housing markets. For example, let's consider the flower market near Amsterdam. In this market, there are many florists. Some of them are buyers and some of them are sellers. Each seller may have an endowment of a different variety of flowers, and each buyer may demand more than a variety. An outcome in this market is going to be a final allocation of flowers and a monetary payments made by the agents. I characterize environments like this for which a mechanism with desirable properties exists. The main property that I am going to require is going to be exposed incentive compatibility. Exposed incentive compatibility states that each agent prefers truth telling, even if the agent knows the preferences of other agents, assuming they report truthfully. So this is stronger than in term incentive compatibility and weaker than dominant strategy incentive compatibility. It is crucial that there exists a common prior about the distribution of values for the success of in term incentive compatible mechanisms. However, for most real-life markets, such a common prior does not exist. The main advantage of having an exposed incentive compatible mechanism is that we do not need such a common prior assumption. I'm going to prove two main results, both of which check the consistency of exposed incentive compatibility with other desirable properties. And then I will apply these two main results to specific applications to get uh, sharper predictions in terms of a yes-no answer. My results are going to provide insight into two phenomena. First, consider a bargaining situation between a labor union and a firm. If they are just bargaining over the wage, then we know that they may not come to an agreement by Myerson and Satterthwaite. However, if we increase the scope of bargaining to other dimensions, such as total employment, labor, retirement, or health benefits, then actually they may. My characterization will tell us exactly when. Second, it turns out that for some markets, we can have a desirable mechanism which leaves some money on the table. So if we have a weak budget balance condition, we will have a desirable mechanism. However, if we require the mechanism not to leave any money on the table, so we have a more stringent uh, budget balance condition, then it, it will be impossible to do so. So for these kind of setups, my um, results tell us why we need market makers or mechanism designers, what their role, roles are. I'm going to, uh, so my paper is related to two strands of literature. The first literature is uh, the implementation literature. Here, the main focus is whether a given social choice or allocation rule is implementable. Whereas my main question is whether we can have an implementation satisfying other desirable properties. My main application is a labor market model that's a one-to-one -one matching problem of uh, firms and workers. So therefore, my paper is also related to the market design literature. The main papers here, uh, the pioneering papers are Gale and Shapley and Shapley and Chubik. They study matching markets under complete information. Later on, several papers have studied uh, matching markets without transfers under incomplete information. And they study various notions of incentive compatibility and another desirable property called stability. They either show that these two properties are incompatible or they make harsh assumptions to get existence of such mechanisms. I'm going to start with the general model, and I'm going to show you the two main results. And then I will apply these two main results to specific applications. The first application is going to be a seller-buyer market with general preferences. The second application is the labor market model as a one-to-one -one matching problem. For this market, I'm also going to another desirable property called stability. And finally, I will conclude. So let me start with the general model first. There exists a finite set of agents N. Each agent I is going to have an endowment called EI, and it will specify non-negative integer quantities for K heterogeneous goods. So what should I think of EI as the amount of money you have to 
No, so for the seller buyer markets, you can think of like uh, for the market near Amsterdam. So maybe for the buyers, they don't have any flowers yet. So this is zero exactly. For the sellers, it specifies how much they have. You know, maybe five units of roses, like 10 units of orchids, and so on. Each agent I has a private information theta I. I'm going to assume that theta I has a connected and compact domain. So this is going to be the private information of agent I, which is the type of agent I. Agents have quasi-linear utility over allocations and monetary payments. Therefore, if agent I receives allocation XI and monetary payment TI, then her utility is going to be UI of XI and theta plus TI. Note that this formulation allows agents to have interdependent values. So not only agent I's utility depends on her private information theta I, but it may also depend on the private information of other agents. I only assume that this utility function is continuous in own type theta I, otherwise uh, it can be a very general function. In this economy, there's going to be a set of, fine, a set of feasible allocations, which is exogenously given. It is going to- Transfer TI, so that I should think of as money. Money, yes. And yes. you assume a common currency, or could each, so this looks as if each TI, one could be in dollars, one could be in pebbles, one could be in, I mean, does the sum of the TIs have to be zero or something? So I'm going to look at different properties that I'm going to require. So like if I require that some of transfers is exactly zero, that's going to be the strong budget balance condition that I call exact budget balance. But sometimes I'm going to require a weaker version, which may leave some money on the table. But it has to be all in dollars. The TIs yes, yes. can't be one, can't be dollars. It's all peppers what's or all dollars. What's the purpose of money if they can't kind of even these things out, right? So, so I think they have to drain the same dollars. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so let's just, uh, so these are monetary payments, so like uh, in dollars. So the set of feasible allocations, so it depends on the application that we analyze. For example, for the seller-buyer markets, only sellers are allowed to sell and only buyers are allowed to buy. This means that as a final allocation, each seller should end up with fewer goods and each buyer should end up with more goods. And for the one-to-one -one matching problem with wages, there are going to be two sets of agents, the set of firms and the set of workers. Each firm can get the endowment of a worker. And in that case, that worker is going to get the endowment of the firm or agents can keep their own endowments. So this is going to be a literally a one-to-one -one matching problem <coughs> where agents can keep their endowments or stay unmatched. I'm going to check whether we can come up with a mechanism which, which satisfies some properties. And for that, I'm going to use the direct revelation principle. So the direct revelation principle states that if I can come up with a mechanism satisfying, uh, which has an equilibrium satisfying some properties, then I can look at the corresponding direct revelation game, which has the same equilibrium with the same properties. The direct revelation uh, game is going to be a pair mu t in my setup. And if theta is the reported utility type profile, then mu i of theta is going to be the allocation that agent i receives, and t i of theta is going to be the monetary payment that agent i receives. Using this uh, direct revelation game, we can calculate the net utility of agent i by participation. And it is going to be denoted by vi of theta. So you are, it's going to be equal to the utility from the final allocation minus the utility from the initial endowment plus the monetary payments received. So endowments are commonly known. So I use the direct revelation mechanism to study whether a mechanism with some properties exists. And the main property is exposed incentive compatibility. Exposed incentive compatibility is equivalent to an exposed no regret property, as no agent would like to change her report even if she solved the reports of other agents. Individual rationality states that everybody should be happy with the final outcome. So every agent is receiving non-negative utilities. They are happy to participate for all type profiles. Budget balance states that we shall not need an outside subsidy. Why is, uh, you have the mu i, the ui of mu i of theta prime, but uh -huh. there's no theta prime there. How oh, here, okay. So on the left-hand side, we have my net utility by reporting truthfully. On the right-hand side, I have the utility if I am reporting theta i prime, but my correct type is theta i. So here, the allocation is going to be 
uh, depend on the report type, but my utility depends on the, my true type. <coughs> so here I don't have theta i prime. And similarly, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. here it's the so. same. So budget balance is an uh, inequality. So the sum of transfers shall not be positive. We don't require an outside subsidy to run. Exact budget balance requires that we do not need an outside subsidy or we're not creating any surplus from the mechanism. So the sum of transfers is exactly zero. And finally, I'm also going to require efficiency sometimes. So this is a condition on the set of, uh, on the set of final allocations. The final allocation should maximize the sum of uh, utilities, the sum, the sum of utilities from the final allocation. So this is just a condition on the final allocation. And I do the maximization over the set of feasible allocations. Now you don't have the, it's not that agents have, a, agents might have a limited amount of money. So that is, you can't implement such a construct. So that's, so if agents have budget problems, then uh, we may have problems, but I'm not, uh, I'm uh, not considering that problem. So I'm assuming that they can make money as much uh, monetary transfers as they want. So there's no uh, budget problems. So first, let me introduce you a notion before I show you the main, uh, the first result. Suppose that we are given an ex post incentive compatible mechanism mu t. Then we can calculate the utility of agent i. Now let's fix the types of other agents. Theta minus i is fixed. And let's do a minimization problem over the type of agent i. And let's find the type which minimizes agent i's utility. I'm going to call this the worst of type, and it is going to be denoted by theta i star or theta minus i. In general, there is going to be more than one type which minimizes the utility, but I'm just going to choose one of them, and I'm going to call it the worst of type or a worst of type. So it doesn't matter which one I pick. All I care is the utility level at the worst of type. So this is well defined because we have an ex post incentive compatible mechanism and the domain is compact. So let me actually go through an example where we're going to identify a worst of type. Suppose that uh, there are two agents, the seller and the buyer, and there's only one good. I'm assuming that agents have private values. This means that the seller's type gives the value of the good to the seller, and the buyer's type gives the cost of the good to the buyer. So here, we're in the private values uh, setup. So we can implement a VCG uh, mechanism to get the efficient allocation rule. Let's pick the VCG mechanism, which gives all agents the whole social surplus. This is one particular of VCG mechanism. Which, which gives all agents what? The whole social surplus. Oh, okay. okay. So like if uh, there's a transfer, the buyer does not pay anything, and the seller receives the payment uh, of the difference. Mm -hmm. This is a particular VCG mechanism where like all agents end up with the whole social surplus. I mean, it's not going to be budget balanced, but I don't care about that right now. So I just I'd want to identify a worst of type for this uh, particular mechanism. So in order to identify a worst of type uh, of the buyer, what we have to do is we have to fix the uh, type of the seller. Let's do that. So the seller's type is fixed. Now what happens if the buyer's type is greater than the seller's type? In this case, it is efficient uh, for them to do the exchange. And the social surplus is positive which is the net utility of the buyer. <coughs> so the buyer's net utility is going to be positive. And what happens if the buyer's type is smaller than or equal to the seller's type? In this case, it is not efficient for them to do the exchange. So the buyer keeps the good and the social surplus is zero, which is the net utility of the buyer. So any type of the buyer, which is less than or equal to the seller's type can be a worst of type. We just choose one of them randomly and call it the worst of type. So, excuse me? So anything in this interval is fine. So this is how we can calculate the worst of types. And let me proceed with the first result. Suppose that we're given an ex post incentive compatible mechanism mu t. So this mechanism does not have to be budget balanced or it does not have to be individually rational. I'm interested in implementing the same allocation rule mu with another transfer rule t prime so that the new mechanism is not only exposed incentive compatible, but it is also individually rational and budget balanced. Mm -hmm. So the condition that I need is a necessary and sufficient condition, and it uh, can be read as follows. So the sum of the utilities at the worst of types should be greater than or equal to the sum of transfers that we have to make for the original mechanism. So take the original mechanism, 
which does not have to be individual rational or budget balance. In order to calculate whether you can come up with a such t prime function, which implements the same allocation rule mu, all you have to do is check this inequality for the original mechanism. So these are the utility levels from the original mechanism calculated at the worst of types. And these, this is the sum of transfers that you have to make. The intuition of this result is as follows. Suppose we know by Holmstrom that any efficient and dominant strategy instead of compatible mechanism has to be a gross mechanism. This means that for any agent I, the transfer rule has to be the transfer rule from the gross mechanism plus a function which depends on the types of other agents. So the weaker mechanism uh, transfer rule plus a function which depends on the types of other agents, which is a gross mechanism. A similar, actually, a similar result holds for exposed instead of compatible mechanisms for any allocation rule. So all you can do is, for, a, for an agent I, take the transfer rule, Ti, and add a function which depends on the types of other agents. So now the question is, can you come up with these extra charges so that the new mechanism is individually rational and budget balanced? First note that in order to achieve individual rationality, the extra charge cannot exceed the utility of the worst of type, which is a function of the types of water agents. So this is the highest that we can charge. Now, we can also get budget balance if and only if the sum of these extra charges covers the sum of transfers that we have to make. And this is the condition uh, that we need. So, so that was a known proxy before, I mean, so the literature. It's so simple that it sort of is astonishing it wasn't. Yes, so let me, uh, let me, uh, let me explain you uh, what we knew from before and contrast it with what I have. Okay. So previous results, which consider similar sets of properties, analyze in term instead of compatible mechanisms and only the efficient allocation rule. Whereas my main incentive, main, my incentive compatibility condition is exposed. And I can apply this to any allocation rule, not just the efficient one. So this is the main difference. So there's an exception. Uh, so Makowski and Mazetti also study dominant strategy instead of compatible mechanisms. But their budget balance condition is the ex-ante budget balance, so they have budget balance on average. So therefore, they still have to make an assumption about the distribution of values to calculate the expected transfers and so on. So Kosenek and Severino is another exception. They, not only they study the efficient allocation rule, but they also study some, uh, the more allocation rules. But they are still interested in interim instead of compatible mechanisms. And they have a model with discrete types. So th this, this is the main difference. So, I, mean, I, guess, so, I, mean, I think when I was looking at the paper, but I guess I thought of this as kind of a lemma. Um, but I mean, if you have the expectation of the expected transfer, would you disagree with that characterization? Or so, lemma to. <laughs> like, uh, lemma in my paper? I, I guess, is, is this your main result? So, this is. Well, this is one of the two main results. But it will be more apparent why this is important in the applications. So maybe right now it seems like we're transparent and maybe I've done a very good job of explaining uh, why it holds. <laughs> but I will, uh, state you some, uh, I will show you some applications where you will see that uh, the results are not obvious at all and they're just applications of this uh, result. Right, I mean, in some sense, you know, people have done, I guess there's a, there's a massive literature here of people in specific applications kind of manipulate the equations way of framing it is going to be very useful in application. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes. So I will, like, in my main applications, I will, like, state some positive results. So these conditions are, are hard, like exposed instead of compatibility, exposed individual rationality, and so on. But it will be possible to achieve these properties in some applications, like the seller buyer markets. I mean, I mean, I sort of, I'm obviously sort of much more naive than <laughs> most people here, but to me, it l looks that it's if it wasn't known at all, it sort of looks they are useful, right? That you can just make an ex post incentive direct revelation mechanism budget balanced and so, okay, also individual rational. So if that wasn't known, it seems like a very useful concept that that's possible. So, 
So you were saying it was known in special cases, or? Well, I mean, I know. I mean, it, I, no, I, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, I get more just that um, when people attack particular problems, then they will quickly come to con conditions like this. But that's different from stepping back and saying this is a general principle that. And also, I think the conditions that people have looked at are like for interim instead of compatible mechanisms and so on. So I think I haven't seen anything where they consider these properties exactly. Okay. And like for example, like you, you're probably referring to like these papers. And these papers are not only interested on, only on applications, but they're doing something a little, little bit more general. <coughs> but the properties are different. That's right. I mean, so I mean, Ilya and I do something like this in our paper on dynamic mechanism design. If you start, if you start, if you start down the path of trying to ask this kind of question, you, you start to come here. Yeah. But you, you have to have decided to ask that question. Okay. Yeah. Is T prime? So it says exists. Uh -huh. Can I assume I have an algorithm to calculate theta star efficiently? Can I calculate T prime efficiently? Yes. So it will be very easy. So if when you start with a T, like when you start with a mechanism which is exposed instead of compatible. It is easy to calculate T prime. So, so it's just uh, you take the transfer rule from the original mechanism and subtract the utility of the worst of type. So that's going to be the uh, your new transfer function. So if you have an efficient way of calculating the worst of types, so the utility is uh, straightforward, and then you'll just subtract that amount from the original transfer rule. So let me. Uh, proceed with the second result. So note here that I'm requiring budget balance, so which is a weak budget balance condition. What happens if you require weak the budget stronger balance in what, in what sense? So the sum of transfers, uh, so I, d I don't need an outside subsidy, but there can be some money left on the table. Oh, so okay. we don't have. Fine, fine. So it's not totally balanced, but it is one way. Yes, at least one way. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Oh, when you say here budget balance, you mean really balanced, no money on the table? No. So it's a weak, I mean, so oh, not so balanced weak. exactly. The serum yeah. is weak. If yeah. and only is, no. is a weak. His definition yes, so of budget me. balance is that you can leave money yes. on the table, but, oh, you, you, but you're not allowed yes. to put money, but to, to but inject money into required. the system. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. So it's not like it clears entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we have to either, maybe there's a mechanism designer there, we have to give the money to him, or you know maybe we have to burn it, but I don't want to use that word, so you know. Sometimes people call that no subsidy. No subsidy. No subsidy. Uh -huh. So I don't know, I, I, yeah, I'm, so I may change the, you know, definitions, but I've seen some papers where they yeah, use the budget balance. Some, some people do this, some people call it something else. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, so <laughs> Susan's I. Susan's telling you her I, preference, I, I think. But, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't, on. yeah, I don't <laughs> insist on the, def, like, you know, the terms, so, you know, we, they can change. So now, instead of requiring the weak one, what happens if we require the stronger one? So we have perfect budget balance. So that's my next question. Uh, in answering that, I will have to drop the individual rationality requirements. So let's start again with an exposed incentive compatible mechanism mu t. Let tau be the sum of transfers for this mechanism and fix any type profile theta hat. So this can be anything really, just pick one uh, type profile. Then there exists a transfer rule T prime so that the new mechanism mu T prime is not only ex post incentive compatible, but also exact budget balanced if and only if this condition holds. So here I've dropped the individual rationality requirement, but I can get exact budget balance, and this is the condition that I need. So let me, so this is, uh, let me just try to unravel this condition a little bit. So for each subset of the set of agents, we fix the type profile for that subset. And then we, we change the sign depending on the number of agents. So if there are an even number of agents, this is a positive sign. If there's odd, then it's going to be negative. So the number of terms here is equal to the two, 2 to the power of the number of agents. And we need that huge sum to be exactly 0. So let me try to give you the intuition. Uh, for example, is this like, um, uh, what's it called? Um, like a telescoping kind of thing where you've Amobius got. Mobius transform? So, so it's like a Mobius transformer, telescoping kind of thing where you're 
where you overestimate, then you underestimate, then you overestimate. Yes, so oh, okay. we have to use like an inclusion-exclusion argument. Inclusion-exclusion. So actually, yeah, let sorry, me. it's too early in the day. That's what I meant. No, maybe that's the correct term. Like, I, I'm not. No, inclusion-exclusion is the right term. Okay. This is a 53-year-old brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, you're exactly right. So we have to do an <laughs> argument like that. So let me try to give you the intuition. If, uh, so what we have to do here, take the original transfer rule, T, and for each agent, we're going to add an e extra charge. And the question is, can we come up with charges that add up to the sum of transfers? So if you can come up with these extra charges, then we're done. So this is a mathematical condition, right? Whether we can come up with functions which add up to the sum of transfers that we have to make. And let me try to give you the intuition uh, how I come up with this condition. Now, let's suppose that the first agent has a fixed type, has a degenerate distribution, so everybody knows the type of that agent. Mm -hmm. In this case, we can give the sum of transfers to that agent completely. Mm -hmm. Since uh, that agent is not facing any incentive issues, this is going to solve our problem. Now, let's suppose that another agent has a uh, degenerate distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, we can give all the sum of transfers to that agent and so on. But now let's suppose that two agents had fixed types, the first agent and the second agent. In this case, we gave the sum of transfers twice. We gave it to the first agent and then we gave it to the second agent. So now we have to subtract it one time if these two agents have fixed types. So we have to do it for all pairs of agents. And now again, if three agents have fixed types, uh, then we've given it, uh, we've subtracted it more than uh, enough times, so we have to add it another time. So I have to use this inclusion exclusion argument to come up with this condition i don't quite understand why you can do this argument at all because the agents <laughs> actually don't have a fixed type well so yeah if it's actually not true so i will actually uh, show you the result when there are three agents so i will so this is the intuition this is not the proof right this is the intuition so what's the quantifier of theta hat so for theta hat is fixed if it holds for one of them then it's going to hold for all of them if it fails for one of them, it's going to fail for all of them. So it's really a random choice in the beginning. Just pick one type profile theta hat. Because of your theorem, right, it must be true. I yes. All. yes, but uh, I mean, so you're right, you know, like this is not a formal proof. I agree. This is just <laughs> intuition using an ex inclusion exclusion uh, argument. But I, I will show you why it falls later on. So uh, let me uh, give you the literature on this. Holmstrom has studied efficient dominant strategy instead of compatible and exact budget balance mechanisms in a private values model. Mm -hmm. So he's only interested in the efficient allocation rule and he's interested in, um, he has a private ma value setup. In this special case, he gives a characterization, which is just the mathematical condition that I gave you, whether you can come up with functions that add up to the sum of transfers. So in this special case, when we're only interested in the efficient allocation rule, and when agents have private values, my characterization can be viewed as taking his analysis one step further. So I don't need to check the existence of functions we get up to something. I just have to check this equality. Similarly, Lafont and Maskin studies efficient dominant strategy instead of compatible and exact budget balance mechanisms for a stylized public goods model. And for this special case, he gives a characterization in terms of a partial differential equation. In this special case, I don't have to make any differentiability assumptions. I can just look at an equation. So my condition is just an equation. These two results can be applied to models with private or interdependent values. So private values or interdependent values. And they accommodate arbitrary correlation of types. However, in order to apply them, I have to come up with a transfer rule which implements the allocation rule that I'm interested in. This may be hard for a general model with interdependent values. However, if agents have private values, then we can use the existing results about the weekly Clark growth mechanisms to find an implementation. So the first part comes for free. That's the approach that I'm going to take for the rest of the uh, presentation. So for, for the VCG mechanism that we picked, we can rewrite the conditions that I gave you, and we can check those for each specific application. So to be more formal, <coughs> let me define the private values. Agent AI has private values if her allocation utility does not depend on the privately infor private information of other agents. In this case, I'm going to denote the utility of agent I by UI of XI and theta I. So it no longer depends on the private information of other agents. 
<coughs> when agents have private values, it turns out that dominant strategies incentive compatibility is equivalent to ex post incentive compatibility for direct revelation games. <coughs> dominant strategy incentive compatibility states that regardless of what other agents do, I want to report my type truthfully. So this is an additional desirable property since I don't have to make an assumption about the behavior of other agents. For ex post incentive compatibility, we assume that they were reporting truthfully, and regardless of what they reported, I want to report my type truthfully. But for the dominant strategy incentive compatibility, I don't have to make such assumptions. Regardless of what they do, they may be lying, they may not be lying, regardless of their behavior, I want to report truthfully. I'm going to, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that agents have private values. Let's pick a particular VCG mechanism that implements the efficient allocation rule. Fix uh, the efficient allocation rule and let the social surplus be the sum of allocation utilities at the efficient allocation rule minus the, su minus the sum of uh, utilities from the initial endowments. So if we do the most efficient trading, what is the surplus created? So this is the social surplus. I'm going to choose the transfer rule of agent I so that agent I is going to end up with the whole social surplus. So the transfer rule of agent I is going to be the, util uh, the sum of utilities from the efficient allocation rule minus uh, the utility from the initial endowments for all agents except agent I. So for this mechanism, let's calculate the net utility of agent I from participation. This is going to be the utility that agent I gets from the final allocation minus the utility from the initial endowment plus the transfers. When you plug in the transfers that I've just defined, you get the whole social surplus. So it is routine to check that this is a dominant strategy instead of compatible mechanism. This means that I can rewrite the conditions that I gave you in the two results that I stated earlier. So I have an implementation for free. All I have to do is calculate the net utilities and also the sum of transfers for this mechanism. So I know the net utilities. Each agent ends up with the social surplus. So I have to calculate the sum of transfers that I have to make. So if you look at the sum of transfers, for each agent, I have the whole social surplus except the utility terms of agent I. If I sum it up over all agents, I'm going to get the number of agents times the social surplus minus the sum of these utilities, which add up to another social surplus. Therefore, yes, the number of agents minus one times the social surplus is the sum of transfers. This works nicely for n equals one. This works nicely for? For n equals one. Oh, yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, let me just rewrite the condition uh, that I gave in uh, the first result, so I can rewrite it uh, using this mechanism. Suppose that agents have private values, then there exists a dominant strategy incentive compatible, individually rational, efficient and budget balance mechanism, if and only if the sum of social surpluses at the worst of types is greater than or equal to the number of agents minus one times the social surplus. Note that previously I had the sum of utilities for the worst of types, now this is replaced by the social surpluses, since the mechanism that I picked gives each agent the whole social surplus. And I had the sum of transfers here that's replaced by the number of people minus one times the social surplus. And now let's look at the condition that I uh, stated in the second result. Suppose that agents have private values, fix any type profile theta hat, then there exists a mechanism which is dominant strategy instead of compatible and exact budget balance if and only if this equation holds. So here previously I had the sum of transfers. Now the sum of transfers is equal to a constant times the social surplus. So we can cancel out these constants and then we get uh, this condition. So these two conditions may still be violated depending on the environment that you pick. So you may have a positive or negative uh, answer. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a couple of examples where the conditions will be more uh, simpler. And I'm going to check whether they are satisfied or not. In the first example, there are three agents. There is a buyer who is interested in getting a small car, and there are two sellers who are selling the exact uh, the same car. Let's suppose that the seller's costs are distributed between 0 and 1, and the buyer's value is between 2 and 3. Why am I choosing uh, these intervals? If they were overlapping, like the Myers and Seder Thwaite model, then I would get an impossible result. So in order to get away from their impossibility result, I'm assuming that 
the costs are always smaller than the value of the buyer. So for this uh, example, the left-hand side of condition three is the social surplus if the second seller has the worst of type plus the social surplus if the first seller has the worst of type plus the social surplus if the buyer had the worst of type. And on the right-hand side, since there are three agents, I have two times the social surplus. All we have to do is identify the worst of types. For the buyer, well, the buyer ends up with the whole social surplus. What is the type of the buyer which minimizes the social surplus? It is when the buyer's value is the lowest for the car, which is true. And similarly, each seller ends up with the whole social surplus. So the type of the seller, which is maximum, minimizes the social surplus. So when they have the higher cost. And this is one. All we have to do is plug this in here and check it, and we see that it is satisfied. So therefore, we have an efficient dominant strategy instead of compatible an individual rational mechanism. Condition four is longer. So first we have the social surplus. And then what we do is we fix the type of uh, one agent and we subtract all these terms. So there are three of these. Then we fix uh, the types of pairs of agents and we subtract all these terms, uh, add all these terms. So there are three of these again. And finally, we fix the whole type profile and there's only one, uh, one such uh, term and this is it. And for the fixed type profile theta hat, we can actually pick anything. So let's just pick this one. And when we plug these in here, we see that they're always satisfied. So we can have an efficient incentive compatible and exact budget balance mechanism. Indeed, we can satisfy all these properties simultaneously using a very simple mechanism. And it is the reverse auction. Each seller makes a bid. The buyer buys it from the uh, seller with the lowest bid and pays the bid of the highest bidder. So it is a dominant strategy for each seller to bid their cost exactly. Oh, that's like so it's like a second price auction. Yes, it's a second price auction where the sellers are bidding and we uh, give it to the uh, seller who has the lower bid. So now let's change our example a little bit. What if the cars were different? So let's suppose the first one is a Civic and the second one is a Corolla. Now, of course, the buyer has two values, one for each car. So it's going to be a two-dimensional type. But everything is the same, right? So this is the condition that we need. And now the buyer's force of type is two-dimensional and it's, it's equal to when he has the lowest value for both cars. Mm -hmm. We plug this in here and we see that it's satisfied. So still we can come up with an efficient, incentive compatible, individual, rational, and budget balance mechanism. The value is below the production cost. <laughs> 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 in the previous example, if the number of sellers had grown higher, they had n sellers, what would have changed? So everything would be uh, would be satisfied exactly. So you we can use numbers one, two, and three. Yes. So like, if there are a lot of sellers, we can still use a reverse auction to satisfy all these properties. You're just using that as a benchmark. I mean, that that that, that case is completely well known. Yes. Can, this is just saying there's somebody who wants to buy something and you run a second price auction. So we, we knew right. in the first environment from, you know, from day one. Of the so uh -huh. the interesting thing was to think about generally. Yes. So but it turns out that like if you look at the uh, second condition for the second example, it is not satisfied anymore. So this means that we can come up with a mechanism that leaves someone on the table, but we cannot have exact so budget what balance. Is this condition telling you? So this is for... Uh, incentive compatibility, efficiency, and exact budget balance. So even if we drop the individual rationality constraint, we cannot come up with a mechanism which is exact budget balanced. Hmm. So why we had a possibility before and an impossibility now? So one way to change the reverse auction that we used before was, you know, maybe we can come up with some scoring rules. So we take the bid from the sellers, and using the scoring rule, these bids are translated into the scoring rule. And the scoring rule is determined by the report of the buyer to the mechanism designer in the beginning of the mecha in the beginning. So that there's no money left on the table. Yes. So first, the uh, buyer reports uh, her values to a mechanism designer. Mechanism designer invents two scoring rules. The sellers make their bids, and their bids are translated into scores using the, these scoring rules. Now the winner is the agent, uh, with the seller with the lowest scoring rule, and the payment is determined by the highest score. So the question is, can we come up with a smart scoring rule so that this mechanism satisfies all these properties simultaneously? 
Well, since the payment is determined by the score, by the highest score, the buyer is going to have incentives to change her reports at the exposed stage. She will want to pay minimally, and she knows that she can change the scoring rule by diff submitting different uh, values to the mechanism designer. So at the exposed stage, she is going to have incentives to change her reports. So we can never come up with smart scoring rules so that this new auction satisfies all these properties simultaneously. And what I show here is that not only you can come up with an auction uh, that has scoring rules, but any other mechanism that satisfies all these properties simultaneously. Now let's change our example by a little bit more. So there are six agents. There's a buyer who is interested in getting a small car, and there's another buyer who is interested in getting an SUV. There are four buyers with different vehicles, like Civic, Corolla, Highlander, and an Explorer. So now I've kept the values in the same intervals. So it's, in this example, it is as if there are two separate sub-markets. There's a small car market, and then there's an SUV market. We know from the previous example that in the small car market, we can have a mechanism that leaves some money on the table, right? The impossibility for the exact budget balance condition. But we can come up with a mechanism that leaves some money on the table. And similarly, for the SUV market, we can come up with a mechanism that leaves some money on the table. Now, what we're going to do is take the surplus from the uh, yes, so SUV that's market. Kind of like the heart line. It's a little bit reminiscent <clears throat> of what Heartline et al. did when they split things into two pieces and then used what was going on in one piece to make it incentive to use that information for the other piece that so, so that it was for budget balance. Right. well we also did something similar for budget balance actually. no you have a case. different budget but, uh -huh. no, no, but, but what budget I'm is saying different. is that <clears throat> you're using different you're, you're using you, you maintain incentive compatibility yes. by using different groups yes to determine it for the other, you, yes. you see the similarity that I'm talking yes, about. Yes, so I guess they were looking at redistribution mechanisms and then they said... I'm, I'm not saying it's totally uh -huh. the same, I'm just yeah. saying this yeah, idea yeah, 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 of yes, using yes. what comes out of uh -huh. one group yes. to take care of the problem in uh -huh. the other group yes. maintains incentive yes. compatibility. Yes, yes, exactly, because the surplus created in the SUV market is not affected by the reports in the small car market. Right. So getting the surplus from here and distributing uh, to the agents on the small car market does not change the incentives of the agents on the small car market at all. And similarly for the other market. In this example, actually, we could change the parameters a little bit. For example, if the first buyer's value was between 0 and 1. So in the first market, we cannot come up with a mechanism that leaves some money on the table. It may be that the first market needs an outside subsidy, just like the Myers and Sarah Fate model. Oh. But the surplus coming from this market will be high enough all the time to cover the deficiencies, the so money that we need in the first market. So even if we change the values, then it will be possible to do so. In real life, it's the surplus going the other direction. <laughs> okay. so, yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm not at all suggesting anything about you know, what's going on in the small car market or the SUV market, but you know, it's just... So now I will go into the proof of the uh, second main result. So let me just uh, show you the proof when there are three agents in the market. The proof actually generalizes. You know, you just have to do some sort of mathematical induction. But I just want to give you the, you know, what, I'm, what am I using? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start. So uh, we had, so let's suppose that we have a mechanism mu t which is exposed incentive compatible, and we have another mechanism mu t prime which is not only incentive compatible but also exact budget balanced. Since these two mechanisms are both exposed incentive compatible, then uh, I slightly generalize the result by Chang and Ely, and so it turns out that the transfer, the difference of the transfer rules, can only be a function of the types of other agents for an agent i. So t i of theta is equal to t i prime plus a function f i. Now, let's look at the sum of transfers. So if you look at the sum of transfers, uh, on the left-hand side, we have the sum of transfers for the old mechanism. On the right-hand side, we have the sum of transfers in the new mechanism plus the sum of these functions. But now this just vanishes because the second mechanism was exact budget balanced. What I do now is instead of theta 1, I plug in theta 1 hat. And I take the 
So that gives me another equation. So tau of this, ar with this argument equals to f1. So the argument of the first function did not change at all, since f1 does not depend on theta1. And then f2 and f3 have different arguments now. But if I take the difference of these two equations, now f1 cancels out. Because f1 does not depend on theta1. So this gives me another equation. So the sum of, uh, the sum of transfers, uh, the difference, and then a difference of f2s and a difference of f3s. Now we're just going to repeat this thing. Now let's plug in theta2 hat for theta2, and let's take the difference. Yes, so f2s actually cancel out. So on the left hand uh, on the left hand side, I have uh, this difference uh, for tau's. There are four terms, and f2s cancel out because f2s don't depend on theta2. So I just get f3s. And finally, when I plug in theta3 hat for theta3, the right hand side does not change at all. So if I take the difference, I get zero on the right hand side, and on the left hand side, I have a difference for tau's. Yes, and that is the condition that I needed. So there are eight terms here, and this is the uh, this is the equation that I needed. So this is completes the proof for one direction. So, where did the budget, where did the balance so I, I just used it here. So when I uh, since this is budget balance, so the sum of transfers vanished here. So I just had the sum of these functions. I see. So that's the only but the budget balance was only true for the setter, not for the setter prime, right? Uh, yes, for the new mechanism, yes, T prime. Mm but not for the setter hat. So it holds for all type profiles. So if a mechanism is budget balanced, then it's oh, okay. for, for, all, for yeah. all theta. Good. Nice. So this completes one part of the proof. Let me proceed with the second part. Now this, OK, we have an exposed incentive compatible mechanism mu t. And the sum of transfers satisfy, uh, satisfies this equality. Yeah. I have to construct new transfer rule t prime so that the new mechanism is not only exposed incentive compatible, but also exact budget balanced. So the transfer rule for the first agent is going to be the transfer rule from the old mechanism, plus all the terms here which have the type of the first agent fixed. There are four of these terms. I include all those. And now the transfer rule for the second agent is going to be the transfer rule from the old mechanism, plus all the terms here which have the type of the second agent fixed, but not the type of the first agent. If the first agent's type is fixed, I've already included those terms here, so I don't want to uh, have them twice. So I have the second uh, type fixed, but not the types of the first agent. And finally, the type of the first agent, uh, the transfer rule, is going to be the transfer rule from the old mechanism, plus all the terms which have the type of the third agent fixed, but not the types of the first or the second. So first of all, this new mechanism is exposed instead of compatible, because I have <coughs> carefully chosen the sum of transfers here so that this extra charge does not depend on the type of the first agent. Oh. Or here, these extra charges do, do not depend on the type of the second agent. And here, they, it does not depend on the type of the third agent. Mm -hmm. So it is exposed instead of compatible. Now let's look at the sum of transfers. So the sum of transfers here is going to be equal to the sum of transfers in the old mechanism mm -hmm. plus all these seven terms. But by assumption, they are going to add up to 0. I was careful en enough to choose this so that at the end I have this sum. So we also have uh, exact budget balance. Mm. So this completes the proof of the other direction. And so I'm not sure how much time. We, uh. Uh, you're, you're fine. You can so this is mm. sort of interesting because here you didn't use. Uh, interesting. No, no, no. <laughs> no that was a compliment. So <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so. Well, there's something I don't understand, which <laughs> is um, that here you did, before you used this 2002 result by what's his name, Alice, and I forgot the name. Uh, Changanili? Changanili. Right. Uh -huh. Where this seems not to enter in this direction. So, actually, I used the reverse direction of Changanili. So, that's, uh, so if. So, where did you use that here? So, uh, to show that the new mechanism is exposed instead of compatible. So, what I'm doing is I'm taking the old transfer rule and adding some extra charges. I still want to guarantee that each agent uh, has exposed incentives. Oh. And the way that I can guarantee is that these, this extra charge does not depend on the type of that agent. Therefore, I still have uh, exposed incentives. Okay. Nice. So this uh, completes the main uh, part of the presentation. Now I'm going to go into the applications. 
And so you said? 10 minutes or so. OK, 10 minutes, OK. OK, let me show you the uh, <laughs> first application at least. OK. So the first application is the seller buyer market, just like the flower market near Amsterdam. So there, uh, there exists. Uh, maybe 15. He's 15. OK, well, I wanted to leave time for questions. I mean, you okay. have to stop by okay. one. But you should for leave sure. time for questions, okay. Okay. which we'll probably insert throughout your talk. OK, you so 10 minutes. So yeah. let me go over the yeah. first application. I will conclude, and then hopefully we will have some questions. So there are two sets of agents, the set of sellers and the set of buyers. Uh, the sellers have some endowments. So these are the you know, flowers that they have, you know, how many units. Mm -hmm. And then the buyers, we can just normalize their endowments to zero, so it doesn't matter. The set of feasible allocations is such that sellers end up with fewer goods and buyers end up with more goods. So only sellers are allowed to sell. Mm -hmm. I assume that agents have private values. So their private information gives, you know, like for the sellers, it gives the cost of production. And for the buyers, it gives the value of the each uh, possible combination of goods. I assume that buyers have non-decreasing utility over the goods. They prefer more to less. And the critical assumption is as follows. For each seller, the marginal cost of production for each good is uh, non-decreasing. And this mar these marginal costs are commonly known by all agents. So there are two parts. First, that the marginal costs are non-decreasing. And moreover, these are commonly known by all agents. So for the seller buyer market in Amsterdam, you know, people may very accurately estimate the cost of production. You know, you know what they need, you know, like. And for, a, for an auction setup, you know, usually it's assumed that sellers have a fixed uh, value for the goods that they are selling. So th this is uh, done by most of the auction. This assumption is done by most of the auction literature anyways. And under this critical assumption, I show that you can have a mechanism that satisfies all these properties simultaneously. So you can come up with a dominant strategy incentive compatible, individually rational, <coughs> efficient, and exact budget balance mechanism. Mm -hmm. So first of all, what I do is I check the weak inequality that I stated uh, the first corollary to the main, uh, the first result. Mm -hmm. And that gives me these properties with the weak budget balance. Mm -hmm. So I will have some money left on the table. But since the sellers have uh, they generate distributions, we can give all the surplus to the sellers in, in any random way. Mm -hmm. Their incentive compatibility is not going to be, uh, does not change. So first of all, why do I need that there is no private information on the seller side? Well, if there is private information on the seller side and if they have overlapping values, then I will get the difficulty that Myers and Cedar Fade are facing. Then uh, I will get an impossible result. So by assuming that there is no private information on the seller side, I'm able to get away from their impossibility. So this is actually a quite surprising result because I did not have to make any assumption about the buyer's values. They just prefer more to less. Other than that, I, didn't, I did not assume anything. So in auction literature, people introduce new uh, auctions for heterogeneous commodities. And they show that this auction performs well and satisfies all these properties if the buyer's value satisfies some restrictive property. For example, Gül and Stakiri assume that buyers have substitutable preferences. Mm -hmm. And similarly, Oswald and Migram assume the same thing. And finally, Oswald 2004 introduces a new ascending auction for heterogeneous commodities. And he assumes that buyers have concave utility functions. And they also show that if the buyer's utility function is not in this restrictive set, they get an impossibility. What are the assumptions there? So in which one? Yes. So that, uh, like for example here, uh, they assume that buyers have substitutable preferences. On the seller? On the seller, uh, well, they assume that the values are zero or like some constant. Yeah. So what is it that they get an impossibility mm -hmm. and that I can have a general possibility result. In a sense, their impossibility shows the shortcoming of the auction mechanism that they introduce. <laughs> right? When I'm looking at general direct revelation games, I'm showing a possibility result and I can show you the direct revelation game. And in a sense, I'm looking at all possible auction mechanisms that you can come up with. However, again... When you say there exists, I'm 
I'm sorry, I should realize this. Uh, do you produce it? So I, I, I can produce a direct you revelation will, game. You, you will produce the game. So, yes. So what it is is that their auctions don't give you that, but you show there is an auction which does. Yes. If it's like uh, increasing but not concave or something, you can produce uh -huh. something yes. which... Yes. So, okay, so it may be desirable to you know, invent an ascending auction like Gulen Sakete does or Osbel does that produces the same outcome. So right now what I have is a direct revelation game. So it's a static uh, game and uh, agents have to submit their, report, uh, their values for all possible combinations of goods. So if there's a few goods, you know, this may be okay, but if there's a lot of goods, it will be like almost impossible to implement. So I'm not going to go over the second application. Uh, um, let me just. So the second application is. Maybe you can tell some of us um, one on one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if yeah, yeah, if you want to. Okay. All right. So let me just uh, conclude. I showed you two main results, both of which check the consistency of exposed incentive compatibility with other desirable properties. And then I applied these two main results to specific applications <laughs> to get a yes, no answer. General conditions may be satisfied depending on the environment that you analyze. But for each specific application, I am able to get a yes or no answer. So in the first results, I checked uh, individual rationality and budget balance. In the second one, I dropped the individual rationality requirement and I just required exact budget balance. And uh, okay, let me actually summarize my result for one-to-one -one matching problem with uh, wages, so I was not Christian able to. Christian is about to ask you as a question when you're done to okay. show him one-to-one -one matching with wages. So okay. I, if you could do it in five minutes, uh -huh. you could take it up to five minutes. Because okay. Otherwise, he's going to ask you at the end of the talk. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let me just like summarize my findings for this uh, spe uh, specific application. <laughs> so this is a one-to-one -one matching problem. So there are firms and uh, workers. Each firm has only one position and each worker can work for at most one uh, firm. I assume, so the critical assumption here is this. For each firm worker pair, there exists a wage so that the firm is willing to hire that worker at that wage and the worker is willing to work for that firm at that wage. Mm -hmm. So it can be IBM and Bob at $200,000. So IBM is happy to hire Bob at $200,000 and Bob is willing to work for IBM at $200,000. Why do I need this? Again, if there are if there is no such wage, then I will get an impossibility just like Myerson and Settle Fate. Mm -hmm. So under this assumption, I show that you can come up with an incentive compatible, individually rational, efficient, and budget balance mechanism. So when I check the condition that I stated as in, in the first corollary, so it's a positive result. However, if I drop the individual rationality requirements, and I, if I want exact budget balance, then I get an impossibility if the type space is rich enough. So this means that for each firm, the value of a potential worker is an interval. So, so the firm could underpay relative to what it's willing to pay. Yes. So under, for the, under that assumption, if the type space is rich enough, that I get an impossibility result. After this, I considered uh, you know, the stability condition, which is, uh, a condi which is a condition studied in the market design literature. So it has two components. The first component is the individual rationality component that I have explained already. Mm -hmm. The second component is the no blocking component. That for any firm worker pair, they shall not be willing to form a match on their own rather than going through the mechanism. So they look at the outcome of the mechanism and they say, okay, rather than getting this outcome, we can match on our own at a particular wage level so that we are both happier. So this is called no blocking. It's an exposed condition, so I call it exposed no blocking. And it turns out that you cannot have exposed no blocking on top of these conditions. So you cannot have a stable mechanism that is also incentive compatible. And then... He adds it to the thing above, which did work. Yes. And then like you may drop this. It's already implied by this, uh, so you know. You can require or you cannot require, it doesn't what matter. If I, what if I drop the individual rationality? If you drop individual rationality, oh, then you can, you can satisfy all these properties. If you have enough money to subsidize uh, people, then you can satisfy it. 
So there's no problem in there. And now finally, you know, exposed node blocking is a great requirement. If we had it, you know, it would be great. But for some markets, it may be that agents have to agree to the outcome of the mechanism before they participate. So this means that you know, they sign a document, a contract, and then they are bind by law to follow up with the outcome of the mechanism. Mm -hmm. For these mechanisms, we do not need exposed node blocking for the success of the mechanism. So for that, I introduce another uh, node blocking condition that I call ex ante node blocking. So at the ex ante stage, before agents know their values and before they know the outcome of the mechanism, they should, be, they should not, uh, on average, they should not be able to get a higher utility level by matching to each other rather than going through the mechanism. Okay. This I call ex ante node blocking and I show that if firms and workers are symmetric ex ante, then we can satisfy all these properties uh, simultaneously. But instead of the budget balance condition, I have on average, on average exact budget balance. So uh, at the ex ante stage, like firms should be viewing uh, workers the same. So if there's a distribution, like the distributions are the same for the workers. And similarly, workers view the firms uh, as the same at the ex ante stage. So this is a positive result. And for future research, there could be a lot of things done, but I'm just going to tell you about two things. First of all, in each specific application, I was able to get a sharper prediction in terms of a yes, no answer. However, what is the underlying structure on the set of feasible allocations which can give you a positive or negative result? This still remains an open question. And for the seller buyer markets, we, I talked about this, uh, about this a little bit. So can we come up with an auction implementation which produces the same uh, outcome? So this remains open for future research. And we can proceed with the questions. markets where this would apply? Yes. So for example, uh, the housing market. So in the housing market, everybody has one house in the beginning of the game. They can do swaps so they can exchange their houses and they're allowed to make monetary uh, exchanges. We know that if there were no monetary payments, monetary exchanges, then we could actually use a top trading cycle. In the top trading cycle, at the beginning of the game, everybody points to the a house that they like the best. So if I like Jennifer's house, you know, I point to her and then like she points to somebody else and so on. And then it turns out that there's going to be a cycle. And then what I do, I get Jennifer's house and then Jennifer gets somebody else's house and then that person gets my house. And then we exclude these agents from the mechanism and we just uh, keep mm -hmm. repeating this. Mm -hmm. So this procedure attains incentive compatibility, Pareto efficiency. And of course, there's no monetary payment so we don't mm -hmm. require budget balance. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that when I allow agents to make monetary payments, I'm not able to get an efficient incentive compatible and budget balance mechanism and individual ration. So I get an impossible result. Another application is uh, a roommate's problem with transfers. So that so was not known? Uh, that was not known. So there's a paper by uh, Miyagawa who studies uh, housing markets with transfers. But the allocation rules uh, that he study are not the efficient allocation rule. So he studies uh, fixed price mechanisms which do not have to be efficient. Mm -hmm. And he just gives a uh, characterization of this, uh, axiomatic characterization of this uh, pricing, uh, fixed price mechanisms. And then the second- You wouldn't think that this is related to the fact that sometimes that housing markets often, often don't clear? Well, so <laughs> they may clear, but you know, maybe they, s they don't clear efficiently. So I mean, one thing in real life is that there's a lot of incomplete information, right? So I can go out and like look at some houses, but you know, like every day maybe I'm going to be able to check five houses or something like that. And I'm going to have an idea about that. And maybe, you know, I have a limited amount of time. So I will not have not any- Not if you're Christian, you'll spend three <laughs> years, but- uh, <laughs> So- You can check 50 houses. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, there's yeah, a lot of things- Still housing markets don't clear often, right? I mean, we all- Yeah. And when, miles, when prices are, ch I mean, when the housing market goes down, uh -huh. sellers are not willing to adjust to the new prices and stuff, but yes. Yeah. And also in housing market, like uh, the housing market that you're thinking should be analyzed as a dynamic game rather than a static game, right? Because, you know, like, sure. yes. like I may buy a house and then like this great, I like the house, I buy it and then we're out of the market. So that house and me is out of the market. 
Now there's a new set of agents and a new set of uh, houses to buy. So it's more, uh, you know, it's better if you look at a uh, dynamic game. Yeah. So that's another application, and uh, the final one is the roommate problem with transfers. So this can be viewed as, you know, like I want to find a roommate, and you know, like other people want to find roommates, and then we can also make monetary exchanges. Or you can view this as a partnership formation problem, where a partnership can only have two agents. So if it's always better for agents to for uh, to find a roommate rather than not finding anybody, then I get a possibility result. Mm -hmm. So in that market, I can come up with an efficient, incentive-compatible, individually rational, and budget balance mechanism. So, so you, you're saying that generalizes, uh, well, we, we know we can do sort of maxing the sex, because uh, sort of the general. What, what? Well, I mean, we can do matching between men and women by using the whatever algorithm. Uh, the deferred acceptance yeah, person. Yeah. Whereas there was not known an algorithm if you don't have a bipartite graph. If you I see. Sort of the, roommate okay. m the roommate matching is a marriage problem with all sense. Right. So, but right. so the gender. Yeah. If you use the deferred <laughs> acceptance procedure, <laughs> so let's. That's a tricky part. But the sex and gender is the same, right? Uh, but so if you look at the deferred acceptance <laughs> procedure, then the side who are actually making the proposals have a dominant <laughs> strategy to propose according to their preferences. But if you look at the side of the market who are receiving proposals, they don't have incentives to act according to their preferences. So they may actually do better if they deviate. Mm -hmm. So the incentive compatibility fails there. But I thought you showed a possibility, not impossible. So I show a possibility to get efficiency, individual rationality, incentive compatibility, and budget balance, but it's not the deferred acceptance procedure. Okay.